Good afternoon, Community for Exceptional Minds. We are almost through week six of distance learning, so uh, congratulations, well done. Um, our emphasis in this channel is just, it's all about community and connectedness. We are not gonna let the season of coronavirus, COVID-19, take away that beautiful sense of community and that safety net that school provides for us. Um, so today we just wanted to have fun. Uh, we have a super special guest, John Kim, is gonna share um, wonderful suggestions for teachers, for families, for students with improving communication skills and um, just enriching our knowledge about language. Uh, he's a speech language pathologist and I call him an assistive technology uh, guru in our district. Um, so he's gonna join us and just give us some really helpful tips no matter where you are in language. And we're also going to make a lava lamp. Um, so join me as we make a lava lamp and then we're gonna have our special interview with my dear friend John Kim after. Enjoy. Hi, Community for Exceptional Minds. We are eating dinner together as a family. Uh, we made spaghetti and meatballs, and I wanted to also do a science experiment with you because when we made clouds <laughs> the other day, the experiment was kind of a dud unless you were able to do it at home, um, but you weren't really able to see the clouds the way that in person you were able to see them. So I wanted to make it up to you. <clears throat> Today, I'm gonna make um, a lava lamp and you're welcome to make this at home. There's not much that you need, um, but if you're gonna do this along with me, you're gonna need some kind of water bottle Alka-Seltzer, any kind of oil, vegetable oil is the cheapest, vegetable or canola oil. Um, I recommend do not use olive oil because that's much more expensive. So see if your family will allow you to use some of the vegetable oil. Um, you're also gonna need some food coloring, <clears throat> but you can do it without food coloring and it's still a pretty cool effect, seeing how the water separates from oil. Um, and we have actually studied back in the month of October, we studied water density. Um, so I do want you to pay close attention to how the oil and water separates. And that's because water, if we remember, water is more dense than oil. So the water is gonna be at the bottom, the oil is gonna float right above it. And so what I need to do first is get rid of some of this water because I need the water to be filled to about one quarter of the bottle. And so I'm gonna pause the video so that I can um, drink the water really fast, so. I'm not pausing the video just so that everyone can take a water break. Okay, and so right now, the water is filled about one quarter of the way. So this is approximately half of the water bottle and that's about one quarter filled. <clears throat> so just eyeball it. Um, we're not gonna do anything exact. So once you have the water filled just enough, I recommend one quarter. Right now my son is so cute. Just eating his spaghetti. He's so intent on eating his spaghetti. Hi, Cyrus. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Make sure you can see the water bottle. Let's put everything else aside that we don't need right now. Okay. Now slowly you're going to pour in your oil. And you don't want to fill it too high to the top, but you want the oil <clears throat> to be filled almost to where the water bottle is full. Now already, I'm going to have you zoom in, already you can see something about density. This clear part on the water bottle is the water. Above the water is your oil. Right now, there are a lot of bubbles in the oil. We're gonna pause the video until the bubbles clear up, and that way you can have a better visual 
when we actually create the lava lamp. So don't do anything else right now. Uh, we're gonna wait for these bubbles to disappear. I'm gonna come back to you and show you what that looks like. Okay, and I'm probably making <laughs> the bubbles worse, even though we're really trying to clear up the bubbles, but I just wanted to show you how the water and the oil is playing on the surface of each other and oil moves more slowly than water. So as I'm tilting the bottle back and forth, the oil is kind of making little waves. To grab your food coloring, so I'm gonna use two colors. I'm gonna use blue and red. I'm hoping that they will actually create the color purple. And I'm not gonna use too much food coloring. I'm just gonna do four drops of blue. Okay, and I'm gonna do four drops of red. One, two, three, four. Now, I want you to zoom in so that you can see the food coloring <clears throat> right on the top of the oil, right here. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna grab just one tablet of the Alka-Seltzer. One tablet, and I'm gonna put it right inside. And we're gonna see what happens. You guys ready? Okay, it's mixing up those colors. See the bubbles rise to the top? Let's see if it's gonna carry. <gasps> Here we go. So cool. Now I'm gonna take a flashlight just so that you can see a little more clearly. Turn on the flashlight. There you go, my loves. Here's your very own homemade lava lamp. Ooh, now it looks like a little tornado. <laughs> Let's see how it looks when I put the flashlight underneath. A water bottle, an Alka Seltzer <laughs> tablet, and just a little bit of food coloring, and that's all you need. So, just for a greater effect, I'm going to add one more tablet of the Alka Seltzer. So, whenever the bubbles start dying down and you want to see the lava lamp again, just take one more tablet, put it inside and watch it do its magic. Okay, good afternoon, Community for Exceptional Minds. Um, today, I wanna talk about language, and I have a very, very special friend, a dear friend of mine who I also am able to work with, and I think that I work with some of the most amazing people in the world. I truly believe that I work for the best district in the world, so I wanna be able to introduce you to my dear friend, John Kim. We call him Mr. Kim at Ramona High School. Um, so, uh, Mr. Kim, can you just take a few minutes and and tell us what you do in the district because it's really fascinating what he does. Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Mr. Kim, or you, or some people call me Mr. John, so it, it doesn't matter which one, but I am a speech language pathologist and also an assistive technology specialist. So 
wow, that's a lot of words, isn't it? <laughs> so what I do is I help students communicate with others. So people who speak, people who communicate with computers, people who use pictures to communicate. So I work with all modes of communication, of how students communicate. And I work with young kids like kindergarten all the way up to age 22 when students are about to go into the workforce and go into the uh, go into the adult world. I love that and I I do want to add to um Mr. Kim's description of what he does um really what you do Mr. Kim and what I've seen you do with my students and so many students in our department and throughout the district is you open up the world of language um, in such a powerful way. And I think it's really important that we understand when we're working with students with special needs or when we're working even with typically developing peers, any human being has the capacity to communicate. And I think a lot of times we as individuals within a community of people we need to understand how many ways we can communicate. Even think about how we communicate something like the word hello. Um, there are, we'll just do in the next two seconds, about five different ways to communicate the word hello. We can wave, hello, hola, in Hungarian it's siya. Um, do you know any other languages? <laughs> really quick off the top of your head to say hello. Um, so what we can do is we can definitely use our gestures. Hello, we can use verbal language. We can use um, sign language, right? Hello, that way. Or we can just nod at someone, right? If we're going into um, pop culture and how, how, how teenagers say hello to each other would be just a head nod, right? Or we can also go into um, what, what our current students are into, and we can say, oh. <laughs> those are very various ways that we can say hello to one another. And also eye contact. If I'm looking at you when you enter the room, that is my way of saying hello. I don't know if you can see nice. this. <laughs> yes. yes, and we can definitely use other other language such as Google Translate to communicate with others, right? I believe uh, Ms. Chami has a lot of Spanish speakers mm -hmm. and we communicate through our translation services, mm -hmm. through our phone, through Google Translate, and we use the website to do that. So in my, um, with my families, I've actually been using Google Translate and I'm learning so much Spanish, which one of my goals has always been to learn Spanish, but um, I'm partially fluent in Hungarian, Farsi, Arabic, um, English. I think because I'm teaching off of such little sleep, I am having a real difficulty, even with the English language. Uh, we teach sign language, you know, as a form of communication right. with my students who do have orthopedic impairment, but who have great opportunity to use their, um, their bodies and their, their limbs to be able to communicate. So exposing them to American Sign Language has been so powerful. And I, I do want to say that something that you do as a speech language pathologist, as well as supporting um, communication through devices, something that you do so well is you open up how many ways we can communicate and right. you open up the understanding of language. And, you know, when we have all these powerful tools with our assistive technology devices um, and augmentative um, forms of communication, it is incredible what that opens up for so many of our students and even the motivation to navigate through their device or even working on a Chromebook they're able to write sentences out and, and form grammatically correct sentences. And we didn't realize that they had that capacity. And 
technology is definitely a way that we can support language and communication for ourselves as well as our students. Um, but sometimes technology doesn't follow us after age 22 or it doesn't follow us from school to home or home to school. So I think understanding the level of gratitude that we should have for technology, but also not limiting ourselves to technology alone. Um, I just wanted to know if you could share with us today um, just how many ways we can communicate, whether it's technology through the American English language, through American Sign Language. Um, can you just kind of open up our world to the forms of languages and and Give us an insight on how we work with students in the classroom and how you work with your specialized degree with students that, that are in our district. Sure. Um, so we have to know the baseline of how our students communicate or how we communicate, right? Everybody has different ways to communicate, even with students who are verbal, right? Some people can use slang. Some people can use um, acronyms like LOL, OMG. That's how we, that's how certain people communicate. And the certain people use various types of accents and dialects to communicate. So just like that, for students who are compromised in their oral language, we have to be mindful and have open, open-mindedness mm -hmm. of how our students communicate. For example, let's say a student who are engaging in self-hitting um, behavior, such as self-hitting behavior. Maybe that's a sign that's telling us, hey, maybe I'm frustrated, I need to take a break. Mm -hmm. Or students who always wanna get out of the class, maybe that's their way of saying, I want to go out. Or what if a student who's not looking at you and not engaging, Maybe that is their way of saying, I don't like that. We just need to be open-minded and we just need to see the entire person rather than how is a student not communicating? And it's giving them more than just that. It's for giving them access to the community, access to the world of how we communicate. And sometimes we as teachers and service providers or, or neurotypical, I call them neurotypical um, population is to be more observing of others and how they communicate. Mm -hmm. And if we just understand how they would like to relate with us, that's going to create a huge change in their world. Absolutely. And I think being such an advocate like Mr. Kim and like myself are for our students, I think one of the most heartbreaking things that I've encountered being a teacher is when my students are given the label of being violent. Um, and it, it is true, you know, we love our jobs, but we also do work with students who have not been taught properly um, how to either navigate their emotions or how to communicate in a socially appropriate way. So, so we do work with students. I've had my hair pulled out. I've been, you know, punched in the face. I've been, you know, um, a little bit beat up, I would say, over the years, but it's because I push my students more than they have been used to being pushed because I believe that, you know, no matter what the assessments show, I believe that they are capable of being exposed to an economics lesson. I expose them to higher order thinking. I give them so many opportunities to access curriculum that their other high school students are accessing. So I'm sure that it's not really desirable for them the way that I'm challenging them. But I think my first few years of teaching, you know, after I, you know, you're taught not to react at all, you know, when you're getting punched in the face or spit on or your hair pulled out, you know, I'm just like a statue, just waiting for them to calm down. Um, and something that I learned is 
yes, they are clearly communicating. Behavior is definitely a form of communication, but how can I teach them to communicate in a more socially appropriate way while also not being so physically beat up, beat up or having these students carry this label of violent around with them or go to a non-public school. So I think something that I've learned with the support of people like Mr. Kim in our district is as we teach them a more socially appropriate way to communicate, what can we replace? If their mode of communication, when you know they're extremely overwhelmed or they're frustrated or they have a teacher like me who's making them do an econ lesson <laughs> when all they want to do is watch SpongeBob, um, <laughs> when, when they're pushed and they don't know how to get out of a situation, um, Something that Mr. Kim and people in his role have taught myself as a teacher is, you know, how do we have them ask for a ask break, for a break. And, and give a sign? This in American Sign Language is break. So, you know, before they get to the point where they would do something that we define as violent, um, let's teach them a better way of communicating. So I've had students ask for a break. We give um, a section of the classroom that we've dedicated for a calm down corner. We have kind of like a little office for them with, you know, visual pictures to help them describe, you know, with a, a mad face or a sad face or a happy face. We have those visual images that help them communicate how they're feeling so that we as teachers are able to teach them a better way to get from angry to calm or from angry to happy. Um, and we can do that in so many ways through sign language, through um, devices, through you know picture icons. So I wanted to know, Mr. Kim, if the way that you support me as a teacher, um, is there anything that you can tell families with um, just like an activity that families can do at home to support communication and language at home? So that is a very um, excellent question. Sure. Um, it really depends on the student, but I would definitely say that structure matters. Mm. We have to give a student structure and we have to teach how that student is going to communicate. So right now when you're talking about when a student is really upset and, and the student is really escalated, teaching would not be the very best, uh, smart way to go about that. What we can do is when the student is actually calmed down and is ready to learn, then we can definitely teach them the appropriate way. So even before we get the student escalated, we probably have to model what an appropriate communication would be. So knowing the student very well, we, we always have a gut feeling of the student's going to get upset, then we'll probably have to model, say, break. Tell teacher, break. Tell teacher, all done. And if the student follows all done, then we grant them access. Okay, he's all done. And he realized, oh, instead of getting mad and throwing things, I can just say all done or break in some sort of way. So a lot of our students who are using um, devices to communicate, I always say model the language for them. Model the tools of how we can use it effectively. And if we think about language development mm -hmm. of kids that are typically developing language, we model oral language for them. We do it in a naturalistic way. And we use that same philosophy to use it with a device. We say, oh, it seems like you're getting, it seems like you're getting frustrated. Tell teacher all done and we model it for them. And the, te and the student is gonna follow that model and we, we give them access to what he requested, right? So that would be the teaching phase. And after that, we try to generalize that skill um, and then we reinforce it right away after the skill. So think of it like language development, how these students are learning language through our vocal models exactly the same way. So for me, what I do is when a student, especially this is what I use for our students in the um, who are diagnosed with this autism spectrum disorder, this is called picture exchange communication system. 
So for example, let's start with this icon right here, drink. If the student is just reaching for the drink, we can always redirect the student. Oh, drink, give teacher drink. And if the student is able to take that off my hand and leave it onto the, to my, oh, to my palm, that way he's communicated that I need a drink of water. And he learned, oh, instead of just going for my cup, if I ask, I can get this. So it always doesn't have to be when he's about to be frustrated. It can be for every little um, activity like drink. Same thing for a student who is using a communication board. I know this is a lot, <laughs> but we can we can aim if the student is really wanting to go to the restroom, we can say restroom. You do, you point, you tell teacher restroom. Oh, now I know instead of just running to the restroom, I can gain that teacher's attention, point to the restroom say, uh, restroom icon right here, and, the, and what I requested will be granted. And same thing with the device. If we have a student who's utilizing a device to communicate, whoop, can you see my screen? <laughs> instead of um, just grabbing it, I can say want. Whoop, yeah, want. And say, I want water, I want break, and so forth. So, just like how we teach students language by modeling, we're teaching them how to use their language, just like how we teach our typically developing students. Awesome. So, is there any way that, you know, if, if parents at home, if families at home, um, if they don't have the picture exchange communication that teachers have sent home with the families, is there any way that they can replicate that, um, you know, through Google search or Google images? How can they replicate that at home? Absolutely. So what I recommend is Googling, uh, Googling communication boards, okay. right? And then you will see a bunch of communication boards if you Google. And um, if you think, oh, maybe this, these are the certain icons that we need, we can always copy and paste that onto our Word doc, or uh, we can email it to ourselves. And if we have I iPad access, we can open up that email of that icon and just teach the student with pointing. Or if we just going to think about, oh, maybe something like this, so he can carry anywhere he goes, where the student goes, maybe just printing them out on a sheet of paper might work. Right? And so forth. So Google has access to communication boards and you can just choose which, I, which board I'm gonna work on. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's so awesome because I think um, a lot of times we feel that if we don't have certain things that we're used to using, like for example, the picture exchange communication or um, an iPad device. What if our iPad doesn't have batteries? What if, you know, we forgot it at, you know, one of our, our family's houses and we're in a different side of town. Does that mean that communication stops? No, it doesn't. We're, we're, we're wanting to expose families and students and just people with all different forms of communication that language is such a powerful tool, but we have to not be limited by language and by common ways that we communicate. So something that I've done with um, my students that I'm actually going to be doing with my son pretty soon is I'll go around the house and I take photos of... Mm -hmm different things that my son requests on a regular basis. Like for example, he loves bananas or he loves playing with his blocks. So I'll take a photo of bananas and I'll take a photo of blocks, things that are motivating for my son. And I'll actually go to CVS and there's a way that you can print photos really small. It's like on a regular photo size, um, I don't know, three by five photo. Um, you can print about nine different images on that one. So it's relatively inexpensive. And then I just cut out the little images. Right. And if you have Velcro, you can put Velcro on a piece of paper or on a board and you can teach your child with whatever, um, whatever their language 
ability is if it's not verbal communication yet, um, but you think that they can get there, then just have them tear off the images and just like with right. the picture exchange communication that Mr. Kim uh, showed us, we can replicate that, but we can actually make real images if we feel limited that we can't find a certain image that's clear enough through a Google search or however, you know, we've been provided with language support at home. So there are a lot of different ways. You can always email me. You can email right. Mr. Kim. Uh, reach out to us because we are here for you. And our job is, um, is so exciting for us. But this season of social distancing, um, I think that there are almost more opportunities that we have because we can, we can really bridge that gap between home and school life in a more powerful way because we're relying on technology so much more. So um, I know I have my office hours every day from one to three. Mr. Kim has his office hours. So we would love to brainstorm some ideas just to uh, better the communication support at home. So any parting words for us, Mr. Kim, or any suggestions that you have? Sure. My last suggestion is that Anyone can communicate. It's just that we have to look at the entire person and see how they communicate. Maybe forming a fist means yes, and not forming a fist means no. Maybe a smile indicates a yes. And maybe a head nod, eye gaze, blinking of the eyes. We have to look into all of those things mm -hmm. and look at the entire student rather than just oral communication. And last but not least, one thing that will never fail me is just plain pen and paper. We can write, we can draw, we can show them the communication board with the pen and paper and just have them point, smile when we point at them. Oh, do you want peanut butter jelly? Yes, with a happy face or no with the frowny face. Mm -hmm. Oh, you tell me, yes, and if he smiles with that, that means yes. So we just have to be creative and be reflecting upon ourselves and say what we can do to honor their form of communication. I love that. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Kim. And um, if anyone has been in my classroom when Mr. Kim has passed by or delivered items or just been on our campus, um, you really have a way of just providing so much joy for my students and, you know, even students who you had never met before, you just come in and, and you immediately read and kind of assess um, their motivation and different things that they, you feel that they want to communicate and somehow you just open up a way for them to communicate. So thank you for the joy that you've given to my students, to my classroom, and just thank you for everything that you do in the district. So if anyone thank needs um, support from Mr. Kim, reach out to myself and I will make sure that you get connected so that we can brainstorm some wonderful ideas because we have so much to communicate with you, but our students have so much that they they just have such a meaningful contribution to our society. And right now our society looks different, but that communication, um, we just really, really wanna see that communication grow and thrive, especially with our support in technology. Thank you for your time. We love you so much. And uh, we will talk to you hopefully soon, so. Thank you. Let's keep in touch, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>